Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So begins Paul's letter to the Galatians, a fighting epistle from beginning to end. And I want to welcome you to our study of this particular book. Uh, This is a presentation of the Next Level Resources, which is a ministry of Ozark Christian College. Ozark Christian College is where I teach. My name is Michael DeFazio. I'm a professor of New Testament and hermeneutics, and one of the classes I get to teach at the college is Galatians. I could not be more excited to unpack this particular epistle for you. Sort of a strange way to begin, but at some level it fits, because Galatians is Paul's first letter, and it just sort of comes out with a swing. We're going to unpack this letter as we proceed throughout this uh, these sessions, as we together study what Paul was saying to the Galatians and what God was saying to us through this particular letter. Oftentimes, when I get a chance to do a Bible study like this, I like to spend the first session just kind of setting a framework and talking about some of my own convictions about Scripture and some of my own approach to Scripture. I thought with Galatians, it really does just make more sense to jump right in, but let me set the table just for a couple of moments to make sure that you're, you know where I'm coming from and what we're trying to accomplish. I, um, I believe that the Bible is God's word. I believe that the scripture is the divine revelation that God has given us, his authoritative truth. Uh, I believe that when the Bible says something is true, it is true, and I'm going to believe it. I believe that when the Bible tells me how to live and tells me what to do, um, it is good, and, and I'm going to do it. And whether or not you agree with me entirely, I think that there's value in paying close attention to the Bible. So I believe big things about the Bible, and that shapes my approach to the Bible. I do believe that God is going to communicate with us through this particular letter. I actually think that Galatians is one of the most comforting letters in the entirety of the Bible. I think that it is designed to um, leave no doubt in our minds that we are indeed free, and to leave no doubt in our hearts that that freedom is something that God intends for us. It is a unique letter, though, because in a certain sense, it's it's an argument. I mean, it probably is one of the most logically laid out and coherent and systematic arguments in all of Paul's writings, and we're going to follow the flow of thought in Paul. But at the same time, it's a very passionate argument. I mean, you saw right from the top that Paul is wasting no words and he's jumping right in. So it's a focused, passionate argument, all of which drives toward one thing. And here's how we're going to approach it. Our desire is to hear from God. Uh, We believe that God wants to communicate to us. I believe that God wants to communicate to you. If you are in Christ, to encourage you with the truth of the gospel. If you're not in Christ, to clarify what you're stepping into uh, if and when you step into the gospel, if and when you join the family of God, the people of Jesus. Uh, So I believe that God is speaking to us, but uh, even though this is God's word to us, it, it was not originally written to us. It was not written by me or you, and it wasn't written originally to me or you. It was written by Paul, who, as he clarifies, is an apostle, one sent by God uh, with a mission to communicate the good news. And it was written to the churches in Galatia. And so what we do when we study the scriptures is we try to hear God by paying attention to what the text meant in his original context. It may be that God communicates things to us that Paul would have thought, oh, well, that makes sense based on what I said, but that's what the Lord is saying to you. But even as we try to seek those words, once again, we keep kind of balancing this tension and coming back to paying attention to the letter in its own context. That's really what I'm saying. What I want to do with you is to pay really close attention to the actual words that Paul wrote uh, to these actual believers living in Galatia and in the process of studying what Paul was saying to them to overhear what the Lord is saying to us. So this is, uh, so far as we know, it's at the very least, I would say, one of Paul's earliest letters. I think that Paul actually wrote the letter to the Galatians before any of his other letters. It's either Galatians or First Thessalonians. And so Paul is, is a major player in the scene of early Christianity. He's, of course, the apostle to the Gentiles, the one whom God called to take this good news of the Messiah to the people who didn't even know they needed a Messiah. And uh, this particular letter 
I believe, was written in the late 40s, and it was written to a group of Christians who were in churches that Paul himself planted. And um, while Paul will go on to write a number of other letters, many of which we, of course, have in our Bibles, none of them are quite like this one. Uh, There's a typical way in which Paul lays out a letter that you do find in in all of them. You, You will often, and this is in keeping with the customs of the ancient world, you'll identify the sender, then you'll identify the recipients, and then there'll be a greeting of some sort. So Paul to the Galatians, uh, greetings. In a lot of ancient letters, it would be really short, just like that. Paul tends to expand some portion of it. Um, If he doesn't really know the people, then he'll talk a lot about who he is and his calling. If he wants to communicate something, uh, words of encouragement to them, then he'll say, you know, to the Christians in Corinth, called by God, loved by God, those sorts of things. Sometimes he'll expand on the greeting. But what he almost always does after he introduces himself and identifies those he's writing to, is he offers a word of thanks. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of you for your faith and your faithfulness and suffering. That's what he says to the Thessalonians. To the Corinthians, honestly, there's a lot of problems in that church, and so he's not particularly proud of how they're living. But even then, he says, I'm just so thankful for the work that God has done in you, sort of a backhanded compliment. But here in Galatians, you get none of that. I mean, right off the top, Paul is fighting. He is in fighting mode. Look, after the greeting, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And from there, I mean, he really doesn't let up all the way through. Now, I want to think about this because Paul is a real person and fighting mode is not something that is unknown to Paul. Before he met Jesus, he was very passionate about being faithful to the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, what he means almost always when he talks about the law. He was very zealous for the traditions of his forefathers. He was very committed to purifying the people of Israel, to getting serious about getting rid of sin and getting rid of those who are compromised and being faithful to to Yahweh, the God of the covenant, so much so that he actually violently persecuted Christians. Some of you will know his story from the book of Acts. And so fighting mode is not something that's unknown to Paul, but it is not a mode that he finds himself in as much as he used to. This is a person who, I, I know he has a reputation for being sharp, But if you read through his letters, you'll notice that this is a person who regularly calls people to gentleness. This is a person who may very well have invented uh, the primary New Testament word for humility, a word that means to think lowly of oneself, to place yourself not too high in your rankings. So this is a person who has learned gentleness and humility and meekness. Paul has been transformed by Jesus in his life. This is a person who in his last letter, 2 Timothy, writes to his younger ministry associate, Timothy, who he mentors, and he says, I want you to teach and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. That phrase right there for me personally is a really important label, a model of how I want to do ministry, great patience and careful instruction, because it can be frustrating when you're teaching people who believe other things and they're not paying attention and all the different things that happen when you're trying to do gospel ministry. So here's a guy who who often emphasizes gentleness and humility, patience and careful instruction, and yet we find him in fighting mode. Why? Well, we find him in fighting mode in this letter because the gospel is under attack. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the situation in this first session and try to frame what I think is going on here and why Paul responds the way he does. And so it might be beneficial to... um, tell a little bit of the story of the Galatian church, and even to talk a little bit about the nature of the various messages that they're um, trying to wrestle between, trying to figure out what the truth is. Uh, Paul, again, so far as we know, all of these things are disputed by scholars, and you can follow up on the controversies and commentaries and other resources. I think that Paul um, planted the church, uh, churches of Galatia, on um, his first missionary journey, which you can read about in Acts 13 and 14. And so he establishes these communities of Gentiles who believe in Jesus by telling them that, um, or these groups of Gentiles who came to believe in Jesus, by announcing that Jesus was, in fact, the one that brought salvation. And as a matter of fact, I think you've got a pretty decent summary of Paul's gospel right at the beginning of the letter. He says, after he identifies himself as an apostle sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father to the churches in Galatia, then he says these words that we tend to read over really quickly. He says the words grace and peace. Now, if you've spent any time at all in Paul's letters, you're used to seeing those words at the beginning, and you probably read past them pretty quickly. But I would like to ask you to slow down, because I don't think Paul is doing this by accident. 
I think Paul is actually telling you in very short form uh, a reminder of his gospel. So I find pictures to be helpful, although I'm not an artist. So let's draw it like this. Let's, uh, let's say that peace is uh, what we are trying to accomplish and grace is the way that we can get there. So peace comes from, well, a couple of contexts, but for Paul, it probably primarily makes him think about the Hebrew concept of shalom which is not just about the absence of conflict, but it really is about a world in harmony. And so shalom uh, in the Hebrew context is a word that describes the world as it should be. So here is a person. This is just sort of a generic person. And uh, this person was made to live in relationship to God. Uh, God created us in his image. And part of that means that we are made for relationship to God. We receive life from God. God breathes into us life. And that's how we're designed to live. But of course, we don't just live alone. We live alongside other people living in community, and these relationships, as we receive life from God, are characterized by peace and love and serving one another and taking care of one another. But we're not just sort of here floating around in the clouds. We're also put on God's green earth, green and blue, if you will. And we've been given this mission to oversee creation, to cultivate its fruitfulness. This is part of what it means to be made in his image, to extend God's rule throughout all the earth together. And in all of this, we have, it maybe sounds weird to say it, uh, but we have kind of a relationship with ourself. And so God designed us to function with peace in all of these ways. We receive life from God and we extend that life and love to one another as we together oversee creation and we experience peace within ourselves, knowing that we're accomplishing that for which we're made. There's a certain joy and rest in the love of God and in accomplishing what he put us here to do. The problem is, well, you know, the problem is sin. Sin is the Bible's word for things going wrong. And basically what's happened is we have decided to rebel against God, Adam and Eve first, and then the rest of us. And as a result, we've cut ourselves off from our life source. And because we've cut ourselves off from our life source, from God, we actually look to all these other things in ways that aren't the way that was intended. You can see it right there in Genesis. As soon as they rebel against God, what happens? Well, they find themselves naked and afraid, and so they are ashamed. They're no longer at peace with themselves. They're now aware that something is wrong with me, and so they hide. And then they blame uh, each other or other things in creation because, you know, I'm in trouble, and so what am I going to do? I'm going to point the blame at somebody else. And the result of all this is, of course, a disruption in their relationship to the created order. So this is the problem of the world as we inherit it. We're made for something, shalom, but we're not experiencing it. And what Paul is saying is that God has actually restored the capacity for peace and he has done so by grace. So to put it simply, God has sent his son to die for our sins so that we can be reconciled back to him. And as we receive life from him, this life manifests itself in a reestablishing of peace in our relationships with others, in our reestablishing of peace in our understanding of ourself and God's good world, and in a reestablishment of our proper task as human beings uh, overseeing God's creation. Now, I know that's a lot, but I really do think that that's what Paul would say at some level is the good news, that God has established peace by grace in Jesus. I think he actually unpacks this for us fairly briefly in the sentence that follows. Verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That is one of many different ways of saying what it is we've tried to depict here. That is the gospel according to Paul. Peace through grace in Christ. We believe in him who died for us and defeated death, and we find ourselves in the process of restoration as we look forward to Jesus returning and finishing the job. Paul comes into Galatia, and he preaches something like that gospel. Then Paul leaves, and some other people come into Galatia, And there's a new gospel that seems to be trending in this particular community. I want to try to present this as clearly and as, what I want to do is I I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to straw man this gospel that we would consider a false gospel. And I want to paint Paul's opponents as if they're just nothing but terrible people who are saying ridiculous things. I do think that they're wrong, but I do think that they think they're right. And so what happens is um, Paul leaves and he goes on about his work and you have this infant church trying to live in the gospel almost entirely Gentiles who have come to believe in Jesus the Messiah, and then some teachers come to town, some missionaries, if you will, and they say, "Um, have you heard of Jesus? And these people say, yes, we've heard of Jesus. We heard the gospel from Paul. We believe in Jesus. We belong to the family of God. We're in the covenant. We've been justified. We've been saved, and we're walking in the Spirit. And these missionaries say, oh, Paul, we know him. Here's the thing about Paul. 
He likes to make things easy for people, so he only gives you half of the message. It is true that God has saved us by grace, through faith, in Jesus. It is true that Jesus is the Messiah. These people are not rejecting any of these things. It is true that Jesus is Lord. But if you really want to be a Christian, if you really want God to be pleased with your life, if you really want to be in the covenant family, what you need is the law of Moses. Paul knows, even though he kept this from you, that Jesus came as the fulfillment of a long line of God working with the people of Israel to establish within the world a people who belong to him. And what Paul hid from you is the fact that you need to submit yourselves to the law in order to be right with this God and walk this path of transformation that you seek. And these Gentile believers are are tempted to believe this. Maybe this is true. Maybe Paul did make it easy on us. Maybe he didn't give us the full message. Maybe the freedom that he preached to us actually was only half of the equation, and now we need to submit ourselves to the law. That's the tension that's brewing in Galatians. That's what these people seem to be wrestling with, is whether or not the gospel that Paul preached is enough, or whether they need to add on top of that gospel that Paul preached, this good news of submission to the law of Moses. And Paul comes in and says, no, not a chance. He says, these people are telling you that's progress. It is not progress. These people are telling you that's a gospel. It is not a gospel. It is not good news. It is a reversion back to something like where you came from, Why in the world would you desert the one who saved you? Why in the world would you turn your back on the one who's provided you salvation by grace through faith alone? And this letter is Paul essentially saying, not a chance, some things are worth fighting for, and the gospel is on that list. And that's really the takeaway from this first section for us. Some things are worth fighting for, and the gospel is on that list. What Paul will do throughout Galatians is he will defend the gospel he preached. One of the things that we'll say over and over and over again is a very simple line that I want to lock into your brains to summarize for you what Galatians is doing. I'll say it to you now and I'll repeat it as we proceed. Galatians is a defense of gospel freedom. I want to say it again. Galatians is a defense of gospel freedom. Paul has one goal in Galatians. He wants to defend the freedom from the law that we find in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what he preaches to them, and this is what we overhear to us. What he'll do in the course of this letter is make a case that the gospel he preached, the gospel of peace through grace without the law, is the gospel. And he'll actually do so in a few different ways. I'm going to give you a brief outline of the book that we're going to unpack. In chapters 1 through 2, that's kind of the first third of his argument. He gives you what we're going to call a biographical defense of the gospel. We'll shorten it there. I know it's autobiographical technically because it's his story of receiving the gospel, but for simplicity purposes, we're going to call it the biographical defense of the gospel. Paul is telling his story. Part of why I want to call it this is you'll find that in telling his own story, he's actually telling the story of how the gospel took root. Then, once we've established some things by looking at Paul's own experience of of receiving and then then believing in and then living out the gospel, he'll turn his attention in chapters 3 and 4, and we're going to look at what we'll call the comparative defense of the gospel. And what Paul's going to do is he's going to go through a series of contrasts comparing various paths, the path that Paul is laying out for them and the path that these other missionaries, these other teachers, his opponents, who he calls false teachers, are laying out for them. And at various points in five different ways, he will compare the two and call the Galatians to make a choice. Then, when you get to chapters 5 and 6, he's going to turn a bit of a corner. Everybody who reads Galatians notices that once you get toward the end of the letter, Paul starts giving you practical instructions for how to live. And some people would say that Paul is defending the gospel in chapters 1 through 4, and then he really turns his attention to, now that the gospel is being defended, here's actually how to live it out. I'm going to suggest to you, as we proceed, I'll try to make this clear, that I do think that in the last couple of chapters, Paul is giving practical instructions for how to live, but I think he also is still defending the gospel. And what we're going to do is we're going to call this the practical defense of the gospel, because I think what Paul is saying is not just here's how to live in Christ and the Spirit, but when you live in Christ and the Spirit, you become the kind of people that the law was trying to produce, therefore defending the free gospel that Paul is actually preaching, inviting them and us to believe. That's where we're headed as we proceed throughout this particular letter. In our next session, we'll begin unpacking in a bit more detail the first leg of Paul's biographical defense of the argument. For now, we just need to learn that at least according to Paul, sometimes, not always, and probably not online, okay, sometimes 
you got to say things sharp. That's what Paul does here. Because some things are worth fighting for. The gospel of peace through grace, of grace and peace, is worth fighting for. Not only believing, not only celebrating, but defending to ourselves and toward those we love. It's worth protecting. Uh, there's a priestly blessing in the in the Old Testament. Uh, you may be familiar with it, and I want to I want to mention it because I think it's really cool to notice how it actually kind of encompasses or relates to what Paul is saying. It's in the book of Numbers, and it was a blessing that the priest would say over the people: uh, "May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace." So I want you to be blessed with the gospel. But for our purposes, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take that statement and to kind of bring it in line with Paul's emphases in this particular letter and in each time by speaking a blessing over you. Really, it's a reminder, and it will be probably every time, at least most of the time, how we end these particular sessions together. What I want to say to you each time is that in Christ, we are saved by grace through faith. That's the first half. I'll say it again. In Christ, we are saved by grace through faith. And here's the blessing from that. Rejoice. Be at peace. Be free. One more time for now. In Christ, we are saved by grace through faith. Rejoice. Be at peace. Be free. <laughs>